and so welcome everyone. This is Sebastian Schlecht from Aalto University in Finland, and uh, I'll let him um, say as much more about that as he wants. And uh, today we're going to hear about feedback delayed networks, which is a really excellent approach to artificial reverberation, uh, simulating acoustic space. And I also just want to add that Sebastian Schleck, I think, is the number one mathematician in the field of music technology today, uh, just based on the papers that I've read. Um, if anybody has a, a candidate for competing and being that uh, advanced in the mathematical contributions, then let me know and we'll discuss. So uh, with that, take it away, Sebastian. Hey, thank you very much, Julius. I, and thank you very much for the very kind words. I, I'll try to live up to that. Um, to that introduction. Hey, hello everyone. It's really my great pleasure um, to be here to um, talk in this seminar and especially kind of with this topic on, on feedback delay networks as this has many, many connections to, to, uh, to Karma and, and the history, the people who have worked there. So um, let me see, I try to share my slides. Hopefully you can see those and I have also a quick sound check. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about um, feedback delay networks and uh, particularly for artificial reverberation. Um, just as a quick background, um, yes, I, I studied actually um, applied math and computer science in Germany, and then I kind of slowly moved then towards audio signal processing and, and virtual, virtual acoustics and these topics. So I've been at at the Fraunhofer in Erlangen, so you might know this as the, the home of MP3 and, and, uh, and, do, and did also a bit of uh, music processing in, in London um, at the Center for Digital Music. And then um, in 2019, I did my PhD in virtual acoustics at, in, at the Audio Labs, um, again in Erlangen, Germany. And since then, uh, since 2019, I'm a so-called professor of practice, um, so a fixed-term professorship in, um, in Alta University in Helsinki, and the, kind of the topic there is uh, sound in VR. It's kind of an interesting position, I have to say, because it's half, uh, half on the technical side um, with the electric engineering school and half with the art school there. So I think a setup which, which might be very familiar for you guys in at, at Karma. Um, okay, but um, that much to kind of um, to myself and now just here a bit of an overview on the, um, uh, on the menu today. So I would like to kind of introduce kind of feedback delay networks for those of you who are not uh, so much familiar with that. Um, and then I would like to kind of cluster um, some of the research topic in, into these two streams. So one is on kind of how to achieve smooth reverberation. So we're looking mostly at temporal characteristics and the other one is how to um, achieve colorless reverberation. So this is mostly kind of a frequency view or um, a modal view. And then at the end, I'll, I'll try to pose, look, try to look into the future, kind of post uh, a few kind of interesting challenges um, which are still there to solve. So okay, let's um, let's start. So um, from kind of starting at the very high level and and slowly zooming in. So here's kind of a tree of um, different virtual acoustics um, uh, techniques. So essentially, kind of you're always trying to um, synthesize model um, a room impulse response. And on the very left hand side, we have these highly physical um, models where we essentially kind of uh, discretize or work in some way with the wave um, with the wave equation. So these are wave-based algorithms. Technically, if you have enough resolution and computing power, uh, you might kind of get the, the perfect physical answers there. Then in the middle branch, we have kind of a bit of a simplification already um, where we have kind of a, a high frequency, typically a high frequency, um, approximation so we have geometrical acoustics and on the right hand side these artificial methods they do have some kind of inspiration from physical processes but mostly we are kind of looking at um, creating an artificial reverberation kind of a, a reverberation like 
effect. So especially from a per, um, perceptual perspective and also trying to be computationally eff as efficient as possible. And here feedback delay networks are one of those um, techniques which have been very um, yeah, very successful since 50 years and kind of have found kind of many, many different kind of implementations. So um, these delay networks are essentially kind of a combination of delays and gains in, in some kind of combination. Um, here's, I think that's a, um, actually I have forgotten the exact model this is, but I think it's a commercial reverberator which was uh, released. So kind of some um, combination of, of letter filters, um, low order damping filters, and then people came up with all kinds of uh, topologies, kind of connecting them in specific ways, some sometimes more motivated by um, some kind of geometry, some kind of physics, but sometimes also more inspired by really kind of some perceptual effects. And I think th these networks, you can really think of them as, as directed graphs. So on the left-hand side, it's kind of really a representation as such. So we ha you have some kind of input node and some kind of output node. And then you have these, um, these middle nodes where you have delays essentially, and, and the, they can be all interconnected uh, with gains, possibly also um, kind of complex gains or uh, filters. And, uh, and on the top right, you see kind of one version of that um, where such a network is kind of built really with a strongly geometrical idea. So this is the scattering delay network, uh, which was introduced a few years ago, um, where you have kind of this shoebox type of room, you place so-called scattering nodes um, on the walls. And then um, again, here in black are now kind of the delays in between. But essentially, all of these are, well, kind of boiled down to, to a directed graph from delay nodes uh, and then fed back and uh, kind of connected through a feedback matrix. So I would say that the feedback delay network here on the bottom is kind of the uh, a very generic kind of uh, formulation of this. And the nice thing is that it directly generalizes what we know um, as the state space system. So the state space representation would have here um, for the delays, just unit delays. And, and you might know that this is um, with a state space representation, you can get any kind of LTI filter. And now we are kind of generalizing in the sense that we can have longer delays uh, instead of these unit delays. So we end up with um, what I often call like delay state space um, systems, or you can also think of this as a nice representation for sparse LTI filters. And this uh, scattering um, delay network here on the top, there you already see why kind of this, um, this network kind of makes really sense kind of for creating reverberations. So because most of the time, kind of when, when sound is propagating through air, there's not much happening to the sound itself. So you're kind of just waiting for some time. Um, uh, so, and, and delays can be implemented very efficiently in the digital domain. So this is kind of the really kind of the key, um, kind of the key benefit of why this representation is so, so natural. Um, instead of actually showing you some some equations, I thought it's actually nice to give you kind of uh, uh, kind of an animated version uh, of the feedback delay network. So what I uh, what you see now is kind of a, a clap um, uh, entering kind of the network here from the left hand side. So this is uh, indicated by this red dot, and you'll see kind of a, a slow mo animation of what actually happens to this clap sound. So this gets distributed to these uh, four delay lines. There you wait for some time. And then on the right-hand side, you'll hear kind of the output. Um, on the bottom, you also see kind of uh, every of these claps registered. So this is essentially your impulse response later on. And then kind of the most interesting part is of course, when the clap kind of returns back to the feedback matrix where it kind of gets copied again in this case to four new clap and then circulates back. And 
And so you will see kind of already two of the really main properties. Maybe I turn down the, the volume a little bit. Ah, okay, sorry. Um, the, um, that, well, over, over time you get more and more um, of these, even in the small system. So this is, um, of course, there's a bit of um, kind of tricks in the animation, but in, in the, all the numbers and the claps are kind of correct from the system. So you really get quite a lot of these um, claps kind of rotating in that system, even if it only has kind of four delay lines. And, and the other property is that, so it, it becomes denser and denser, but it also has this exponential decay we would like to have on such a system. Yeah, so um, there are kind of two classical challenges um, to designing uh, feedback delay networks. So one is smoothness and the other one is colorlessness. So let's start with the um, smooth reverberation. So here's kind of the kind of the, the cartoon of a of an impulse response. So with the dark sound, early reflections, which are still somehow sparse and then becomes denser and denser until you have kind of this stochastic late reverberation. And often um, if you squeeze kind of performance and try to do kind of a minimal system, um, one of the challenges is that in this transition region between early re reflections and late reverberation, you don't have enough density. So it kind of still sounds rough. You don't kind of get this lush um, late reverb sound, uh, which you often, especially for music production, movie production, um, what is desired. Um, there's actually a way to get uh, around that by making the delays very short, but then the problem is that you get a lot of repetition or kind of, um, kind of temporal um, patterns. So you are kind of in this, you have to kind of find somehow that sweet spot. Um, between, between creating enough density, but avoiding um, these repetitions. So, um, and this has a lot to do with the feedback matrix. And before I kind of show kind of different designs and this feedback matrix, I'll, I'll like to kind of, um, kind of describe a bit the playground we have. So, so the mathematical constraints we have on that. So um, these reverberations, especially kind of long reverberations where we have two seconds or up to 10 seconds um, of T60 are actually um, systems which are very close to instability, right? So if you look at the, at the system poles of such a system, they are very, very close um, to the unit circle. And it turns out and, um, people have found out um, fairly early that it's kind of much better to really start kind of with the ideal case of a so-called lossless system where we have all the poles exactly placed um, on the unit circle. So we have kind of a non-decaying, um, non-increasing response. And then later on kind of put a little bit of damping um, on the system so we kind of um, uh, can control uh, this, this almost unstable system nicely. And this damping is kind of nice to control because we are kind of just manipulating the system into one direction, so contracting it. So the question is then, okay, how do we get um, kind of this ideal situation with a, um, with a lossless matrix? And the simplest version of it is that um, we choose an orthogonal matrix. Uh, so here, um, A, uh, denotes the, the feedback matrix. So a, a transpose being the identity matrix is kind of as the definition of um, being orthogonal. And, and an alternative uh, property the orthogonal matrix has is that it um, preserves the energy from the input to the output. So if the input vector has the norm one, then also the output of that um, matrix has has the same norm. So you can, and, and the delay itself is also um, a non-preserving operation. So when you kind of go, go in circles, the energy doesn't change. So you're already very close to, to um, a lossless system. Um, FDNs have kind of one invariance, which kind of makes this a little bit tricky um, uh, or make basically all the proofs a little bit hairy. Um, and this is that, the FDN, at least the loop itself, is um, invariant uh, under diagonal conjugacy. So you can essentially take any kind of diagonal E, uh, which is invertible, so it doesn't have a zero, uh, and kind of multiply uh, um, 
and before and after um, the feedback matrix, and you would still get the same um, uh, loop response. That's by itself fairly easy to see. So if you have kind of the this matrix E um, here and the inverse here, you can essentially kind of contract it uh, because all of these are diagonal matrices um, through the delay line. So th this invariance itself is easy to see, but if you need to do kind of constructive proofs, then um, you always have to kind of wonder, okay, is there actually some kind of um, diagonal matrix um, which um, so that this matrix is similar to an orthogonal matrix? So this is kind of one of the um, complications if you, if, you, if you would like to prove, for example, um, whether an FDN um, matrix is unilossless or not. But I think for most of the talk, essentially we are quite fine kind of assuming that the feedback matrix is orthogonal. Um, and here's a, a number of, um, uh, or yeah, a, a collection of um, special matrices which were kind of proposed in this context. Um, so there are, uh, and they were proposed for uh, very different reasons. So we have um, things which are proposed because of uh, computational reasons, uh, like the householder matrix, uh, you have the householder transform, so this is very um, uh, quick to compute. Hadamard um, matrices can be also um, computed a little bit faster. Um, the same with the uh, circulant um, matrix, which uh, relies on the DFT um, uh, or on an FFT uh, across the channels. Um, but there are also um, matrices which are kind of um, translated actually from their um, from their topologies. So we have the Mura Schroeder reverberator, which is a combination between um, a section of parallel um, uh, delay lines and a section of um, serial all pass filters. So you end up kind of with this block structure um, of a diagonal matrix part and kind of a tri and triangle part. And on the top right, you see the nested all pass. So for those familiar, it's uh, it's a translation of the Gardner all pass filter. So where you're kind of um, nesting kind of all pass filters uh, within each other. So you can, like I've shown you before with the um, with this graph uh, topology, you can essentially kind of translate all of these into um, into this FDN language. So um, so this was kind of the state of the art um, until. 2019, I think, trying different matrices, trying to kind of determine some properties. And, and of course, the more denser you, um, you choose in this matrix, kind of the, the more a kind of a denser kind of response you have, at least hopefully. Um, and there was an idea that, hey, could we do also something kind of in the third dimension? So kind of, can we replace um, these filter gains actually with small, um, uh, sorry, the, these gains in the matrix just with small filters? Um, still, we need to be um, orthogonal or kind of energy preserving. And in the language of um, kind of uh, a matrix of filters that would be so-called para-unitary um, matrices. And there are many ways to construct those, but it turns out, at least for me, it was kind of easiest to do it in, in, in the way depicted so that we have kind of these staged implementations. So we have kind of a section of delays and a sec uh, um, one mixing matrix, a section of delays and mixing matrix and multiple of those. So something which actually looks exactly the same as already the original FDN, but the design philosophy is a little bit different. So in the original uh, or in the big loop, so to say we have fairly long delays. So these could be really 10 to 100 milliseconds long. Here in within the matrix, we're kind of looking at very, very short delays. Um, so maybe just a few samples uh, and and by, by staging those, we can kind of create this um, small scale um, temporal smearing and kind of make kind of each of these reflections kind of going through the feedback matrix more complex. Um, so that, just mm -hmm. a quick question on that. Does that replace the matrix or is that the new structure? Because I don't see a feedback path here. Ah, sorry, yeah. This only replaces the, the matrix. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, 
So here's kind of the simplest version of that. Um, you only have um, delays in, you have the mixing matrix and delays out. And surprisingly, all, uh, only that already improves um, the, um, the number of pulses you have at the output quite a lot, because it turns out that in the, in the classical formulation of the FDN, um, many of the pulses actually come out at the same time. So you can think of you first go through the first delay line and then through the second delay line. So the time is first delay plus the second delay. And if you send something into the second delay line and then through the first delay line, you end up at the same time. So you're already um, kind of dividing kind of the number of um, the density just by that. And, and just adding a little bit of extra delays um, gives you uh, almost a square uh, of um, more, um, more of these pulses for basic, almost no computational addition. And so if you um, do this a bit more, um, so actually uh, introducing multiple stages, I think these are four stages. Um, so all of these are four by four matrices. So there are four main delay lines and each of these um, matrix entries are then these small FIR filters. Um, and so these are um, uh, constructed with small delays. So just a few samples and then a random orthogonal matrix. So you kind of get these, these noisy responses. And one which turned out to be quite nice and takes a bit of a inspiration from a different reverb um, theory are these velvet um, feedback matrices. So in this case, we choose a little bit longer delays and then uh, and choose them carefully. So in a way that if we do these mixings in between, that never two of these um, um, pulses kind of overlap. So we don't lose kind of any kind of density. And, and for the mixing, um, we choose a Hadamard matrix. So essentially all of these game, all of these pulls uh, amplitudes are the same. Um, and we can kind of stretch out this a little bit because from, um, from velvet noise um, theory, we know that kind of for a perceptual dense um, reverb, we don't need to have a kind of a fully occupied um, signal. So most of this can be sparse. And essentially we know kind of one pulse per half a second is typically good enough for the, for the auditory system to be satisfied that this is kind of um, smooth noise. So you can, uh, can use these kind of perceptual um, techniques to, to create this, um, uh, this type of matrix. And these are, uh, so at the bottom you see this has, each of these has 418 samples length, but for the implementation, you only need two stages. Um, so in each stage, you are adding um, 16 uh, or you're um, multiplying by four um, um, with the number of pulses. So each of these uh, sequences has then 16 pulses, but they are all at different points in time. So uh, I'll show you kind of what this does in effect. Um, and actually here as kind of a bit of a mental image for kind of how this connects maybe to physical reality. Um, you might think of it, um, as kind of scattered or rough surfaces kind of creating a series of image sources. So instead of having just a single pulse being reflected in, in at the perfect reflection, you have kind of for first order um, reflections kind of a a series kind of a line of image sources. And then if you have a second wall kind of, then of course, each of these kind of um, substitute image sources kind of get um, scattered as well. So you kind of have a quadratic as many and, and so on. So kind of this, uh, the scattering effect is particularly nice because it 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 stacks up recursively. So um, uh, coming back to the at the end. So if we take, this um, this velvet feedback matrix. We're now following really one one path, uh, a single path through the system. So the first time it goes through the system, it well has exactly kind of the copy of this FIR filter. And uh, next time it goes through um, the matrix, it gets convolved with a different version of that FIR filter depending on the path. Then we do this 
uh, a third time and a fourth time. And, and you see that this kind of gets spread out quite a lot. And in comparison, you see kind of with this red um, pools, um, what you would get from a classical FDN. So every time you would get kind of just a single pulse and it gets attenuated over time, that's it. So really kind of this comparison is, is um, what um, creates a lot of density. So in, in effect, I, uh, I can show you here um, two responses, um, one with a normal scalar um, valued um, feedback matrix and one with this velvet feedback matrix. And, and also in red is kind of the an echo density profile. So kind of a measure for kind of the how Gaussian um, that response is. And for the, for the top one, for the classical one, this, this measure stays quite low over the course of that uh, whole response while for the feed, velvet feedback matrix, uh, it goes up um, much, much quicker. And as said, this is only two stages. So you just need to have um, twice uh, four delays and twice a Hadamard um, matrix. So it's much, much less than what you would need in, in terms of operations if you would have a bigger FDN. Yeah, so this is um, a little bit of what I wanted to tell about um, kind of how to improve the, the temporal response. And in, in the second part, I'll, uh, I'll introduce some kind of, uh, yeah, uh, kind of tackle another problem and going towards uh, colorless reverberation. And this is really, uh, sorry. Sorry, could I interrupt with another yeah. question? I'm just wondering, uh, it improves the echo density and that, that's fantastic, we all like that. But what about comparing that, for instance, with um, something like time squared divided by volume? Like, do, do we have any intuition on perhaps just an absolute echo density, how FDNs behave in this regard? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, but um, but there are two qualities to that. So the one is, um, uh, I haven't included this in this presentation, but there's a paper um, um, from my PhD where there is um, a proof that kind of the polynomial goes with the number of delay lines, so the kind of the highest order. If you have eight delay lines, the, and the polynomial would go um, um, to the power of eight. Um, the, uh, so in, in terms of numbers, we have way too many, typically, um, compared to a shoebox room, um, as, uh, just because we have typically many more than three delay lines. Three delay lines would kind of mimic directly um, what we see in a shoebox room. But these um, reflections, they come in a much more ordered way. So in the shoebox room, um, they look like a grid um, if you kind of draw these image sources. But if you compute the distances, you would take the Euclidean distance. So actually, you would never get the repeating, directly repeating pattern. Um, one consequence of this is the sweeping echo. There's a nice paper on that. Um, in the FDN case, you get kind of you get a Manhattan norm, so you get kind of perfect repetitions. So this is one one big difference there. And and the other one here in this case, I'm more concerned with the quality of each of these reflections. So because I think in many reward situations, we don't have kind of this image source, kind of a single pulse reflection, but we have some kind of temporal spread, which is, I think, perceptually um, quite important. Yeah, cool. Okay, um, yeah, so colorlessness. This is um, really kind of this, this is a problem which starts directly with the first paper um, kind of in the field. So um, here Manfred Schroeder and Logan, they, they published this um, paper, Colorless Artificial Reverberation, I think 61 is it. And they have it already in the title, so they are kind of um, they are kind of proud that they have a, a solution towards that, and they also um, 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 
um, post this here kind of as a as a principle and how to do good artificial reverberation. So this is their point six that somehow you would like to um, avoid these comp-like frequency responses producing unpleasant, hollow, reedy, metallic sound qualities. And interesting enough, it that really stays kind of the kind of the haunting problem in in creating uh, kind of these delay network based artificial reverberators since then okay. every everyone every practitioner you ask is okay how do i actually choose all these parameters so it doesn't give me this metallic sound um one way around this the simple way um by the way is kind of just you choose a very big um, network that's typically a good way to get around this but then you're kind of defeating the purpose of being um, very uh, very efficient so actually I'll play you um, a, a version of that um, of that structure um, it's a bit simplified version of that it's just all past um, um, in a series probably four of them so this is the impulse response So you kind of get this very metallic uh, quality at the end, which is kind of surprising because the point of that uh, that whole thing is that um, you have all pass filters all along. So the frequency response is technically perfect flat. Um, that's maybe not the most favorable parameterization, um, but I'll, I'll go a bit further into um, how and where this happens. And so before I kind of directly um, try to explain kind of how this colorlessness kind of works, uh, I would like to introduce here one technique or kind of one analysis method, which um, really helped us kind of to, to gain more understanding and that's modal decomposition. So here again, um, kind of the, the block diagram of the FDN and, and of course the, the, the typical way to use this is um, to do time domain recursion and, and generate this impulse response or if you send in a signal, you have directly the, the convolution. But with any kind of um, LTI system, you can also decompose this into modes. So essentially you have a list uh, of these exponentially decaying sine waves and they have typically four parameters. So amplitude, frequency, decay rate, and also initial phase, which I kind of left out of the picture because it's not so relevant in that context. And then you can take each of those basically kind of design a bi um, biquad filter with it uh, and then synthesize kind of these um, well exponentially decaying sine wave and then if you sum up all of those um, you will end up um, exactly with the same time domain recursion but um, although you would never do this kind of computationally for synthesis um, at least not for the FDN there are modal reverberators where this is kind of a nice technique um, but in this context it's really kind of just for analysis and it's interesting to see kind of what how the FDN um, looks like here so essentially kind of what you're doing mathematically it's kind of a partial fraction decomposition and and really the challenge is the system order so the system order of these LTI filters is um, always kind of the number of necessary delay um, elements you need to implement that um, and that structure. And typically for the FDN, this is the sum of, um, of the delay line length uh, in samples. So you often end up this being over 100,000, maybe even a million samples. Um, and there are these two components to this. One is the, the system pole. So we, we already explained kind of um, with, the, with these lossless systems, we constrain them to be on the unit circle. Later with the damping, we can kind of contract them into the unit circle. But um, the interesting part is actually the top one. And I think this has been neglected for some time. So this is um, uh, in partial fraction decomposition. This is the residue in, if we talk, think more about kind of the, the physical meaning that would be the the mode excitation so the phase and the magnitude of the uh, of the, in in the initial state of this mode and um actually uh, to to solve that um this is kind of just a techni technicality to actually get to that point um it's much nicer to use something like the Ehrlich-Arbeit um uh, iteration so something which 
keeps kind of the FDN compact. Um, one way to solve that would be that you kind of expand the whole FDN into a kind of a big state space representation and you could just do any kind of eigenvalue decomposition. Um, but because you have this very um, structured sparse system, it's much nicer to do kind of a polynomial matrix um, type of method. And, and that works really nice for FDNs and this can scale very easily into the into the millions. So the result, what you get from this is, is this here. So on the left-hand side, um, these are the poles. And I, I've um, kind of depicted them kind of a bit more interpretable from a, from a um, perceptual point of view. So you have to um, pull angular frequency, so from zero to pi. So this is kind of the audible frequency or the, the resonance frequency. And then on the y-axis, the, the pole RT60. This is now um, already with a frequency dependent um, uh, damping. So uh, each of these delays are extended by um, uh, first order um, uh, low pass filter. So you see there's a little bit of um, kind of spread in, in the middle frequencies where some frequencies decay a bit faster than slower. This depend and this and this has to do with the uh, kind of how accurate you can design those uh, and damping filters in, in that transition region. And if you, if you want to have kind of a tighter specification, then you need to have kind of higher order filters there. And also if you have want to have kind of more complicated shape, then also you need um, higher order filters. And that's kind of an, an own uh, research question. I think for the colorlessness, really the important bit is on the right-hand side. So again, we have the, the same um, poles, um, pole angles. Uh, on the x-axis, but on the y-axis, we have the residue magnitude. And, and this is in dB. And you already see that um, the dynamic range of these mode excitations are quite wide. So this is more than 40 dBs. So if you think of them from a perceptual point of view, there are really many modes you probably just don't perceive. You could kind of, kind of just cut them away and the reverb would sound exactly the same. And then there are these, those ones here at the very top and they will kind of determine the color of what you hear. And metallic might just be kind of certain single modes kind of sticking out of that crowd and being just excited too much. Because the, um, it's important to know to realize that the time domain behavior of all of these modes are perfectly the same, right? So they are kind of, this is a solved problem, but really this mode excitation is still um, basically unconstrained. Can I ask another quick question? Yeah. Um, I guess my intuition would be that the modes would all be very similar, if not the same magnitude. And I, uh, if we if we were to look just at one frequency zone, can you give me some intuition on why we have this spread? That's really not intuitive to me. Um, are you, is your intuition coming from room acoustics or from the from the FDN system? Even thinking of the FDN, I would think that all the modes would be the same magnitude initially, especially if you were to take the feedback filters out of the uh, equation. Yeah, yeah, that picture looks exactly the same if we don't if we have a lossless system. Um, hmm. What's the intuition? Actually, um, okay, I can. One intuition I can give you is. Um, if we make this even simpler, and uh, so we take just COM filters, feedback COM filters, so a diagonal feedback matrix, and, and we feed them all kind of with the same gain. So input output gains are all one. Now, the shorter the delay, ah, okay, and the feedback matrix is just, it recurs with one, so non-decaying. Right, so now the short filters actually produce much more energy than the long delays. So they are kind of buzzing, kind of. Um, so the, it's essentially they're all creating a pulse train, just the one with a shorter frequency. Okay, and that is something that when you design FDNs, you do experience that those short delays can be very prominent. Yeah. Gotcha, cool, thank you.
And yeah, so, but we don't, so this is certainly an intuition and you can also think about this. Okay, if I have different delay lines, would I kind of try to choose, for example, the diagonal elements in a way that short delays don't feed short delays, short delays should feed long delays. And so you can kind of come up with these heuristics, but it's kind of hard to combine this kind of with the um, kind of within this orthogonal constraint and so on. So one, a bit of a detour we did now is um, um, trying to use all pass filters, all pass FDNs. Um, although we know that they not a guarantee um, to solve the problem, but maybe if we kind of do it right, kind of if we have a flat frequency response, maybe it still helps us to somehow control this mode excitation. Um, so uh, here are just a few uh, slides on, on all pass FDNs. So it's just a small detour. Um, so there are um, these classic um, Schroeder type of feed forward feedback comp filters. You can kind of chain them in a series. Um, as mentioned already, the, the gardener nested ones, so you can stack them and kind of nest them um, within each other. And there is also one example for MIMO system, which is all pass, and which is this um, Poletti's um, um, uh, filter, which is kind of a vectorized version um, of a lattice all pass filter. And the question was, okay, can we actually kind of um, generalize this and kind of make a bigger theory um, of, of FDN structures? So the, the formulation I use now is, so far we've been really kind of only thinking about the feedback matrix A, but um, actually to get this all pass property, we have to look at the full system matrix. So we are also including B, C, and D. So and B, the input uh, gains, C, the output gains, D, the direct gains. So in this Poletti example, you would have, in this MIMO case, you would have these uh, these four blocks and we stack them together into, into one matrix. And the nice thing is you end up with a very similar theory than um, with these uni-lossless system. So here we are looking at uni all pass. So that's kind of just a word to say this should be all pass for any choice of delays. And, and the condition you have to fulfill is very similar. So now um, if you look at that kind of that equation down there and kind of just assume for a second that X is an identity matrix um, that this whole thing collapses to, hey, the system matrix has to be orthogonal. And then this whole thing is uni all pass. And very similar to the FDN uh, or the, the losslessness is we can have this invariance under, uh, under diagonal conjugation. So you can have uh, a diagonal X matrix, which kind of alters that system a little bit. And, and this doesn't harm kind of the, the, the all passness. And the nice thing is all of these examples which were kind of uh, handcrafted before, um, they fit in exactly into that um, into that framework. Um, now, the, the the tricky part begins now if if you try to marry these kind of two steps. So you want to have an all pass system, but you also have a strong notion what the feedback matrix should be like. So you want to have kind of this feedback matrix plus some damping. So this leads to a so-called completion problem where you have to you first design the feedback matrix and then you, want, you have to choose kind of the rest, the input, output gains, direct gains in a way so that the whole thing becomes all pass. It was actually quite a surprise to me that this really works, that we can go all the way and have these um, Kind of damping proportion, um, sorry, uh, delay length proportional um, gains, and and use this as our new feedback matrix, and then still find um, kind of the right um, um, the right input and outputs, uh, so that the whole thing is um, is all passed. So, uh, and you still have a, a number of uh, degrees of freedom. So um, okay, now coming back. So how, how does this actually help us for the for the colorlessness? Um, now there's on the left hand side you see the modal excitation um, 
for the random orthogonal and for the all pass FDN. And the random orthogonal looks like what we had before, but now with this all pass FDN is that all the modal excitations are in this very narrow band. You can also um, and translate this into into histograms. So kind of the all pass FDN is kind of this blue, very narrow distribution. The random orthogonal is a bit wider. And I like to, sorry, there are maybe a bit too many of those curves, but I like to kind of uh, draw your attention here to the Schroeder series. So this um, light green version um, where we have kind of the, the distribution starts similar to the all pass FDN, but then has a long tail um, to the top. And this is probably exactly the reason why um, the Schroeder series um, sounds so metallic. And we have um, confirmed this also with a perceptual test where you can get quite a good prediction from these um, modal excitation distributions to the, the perceived colorlessness. So um, all pass, um, this new all pass FDN is kind of the most colorless where it has this very narrow distribution and, and the wider the distribution is, and especially the more um, excite, um, um, high energy modes you have, um, uh, the less colorless it is. Um, so in some sense, it's nice. So we have at least one way to construct these colorless um, FDNs, but we also ended up a bit with a conundrum. So we have now all pass systems, which are very non, um, so very colored, but also kind of all pass is somehow the solution to kind of get colored systems. So there's some property we're missing um, kind of in between or which is underlying this. And that's kind of current, current work. Um, but at least we have kind of the first key, I think, towards towards that problem. Sorry. Ah, okay. These are two examples. Just uh, so one, the var colored version, and the um, colorless. So there, there's really only parameter uh, um, difference. So no extra kind of magic. It's really kind of if you choose your parameters nicely um, or not. Uh, I hope that that's fairly fairly obvious. Um, okay. Uh, probably I uh, I'll give a few kind of a few pointers kind of towards the um, towards future challenges and then um, we can go into the discussion. So. Um, Kind of a whole new set of um, algorithms I haven't really talked about today is um, anything related to virtual reality and 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 games and so so something which has spatial logic. So um, there are um, some um, some suggestions on how to do um, directional reverberation, um, even directional T60. So you kind of include some kind of ambisonics transforms. In, in the feedback loop to enforce um, that. Uh, there's also um, really nice work now on how to do coupled spaces. So you can kind of subdivide um, that feedback matrix um, to kind of represent um, different rooms and also the interconnection between those rooms. And because we have kind of a good theory on how, um, how the energy should be preserved. I think there's also good techniques now to design these coupled um, space reverberators. And you can also do this for many, many spaces. And I think on a, on a more high level, um, I think there are three, um, three directions I see which, which are still open. Um, is uh, the one is I think which is a very classic problem actually for the FDNs is how to take a room impulse response and kind of generate an FDN. And I think kind of the the, the last few papers really tried to tackle this um, um, using deep learning techniques, which is I, I think fine and, and a good idea. Um, but there are I think two more fundamental problems, which is not just an optimization problem. So the one the first one is is what do we really want to fit early reflections uh, with the FDN or is this just a purely late reverb technique? Um, so do we need to do hybrid techniques or not? Um, 
we don't have that many degrees of freedom in an FDN. So is this good to spend those kind of for fitting early parts or not? How important is it to fit those? And, and the second one, which is also quite problematic for, for all these um, kind of learning based systems is what is really kind of our perceptual kind of similarity metric. Um, I think we still don't have really kind of a good proven kind of metric where we can say, okay, um, these two uh, room impulse responses are perceptually similar and really helps us to um, constructively kind of um, uh, learn towards the right goal. Um, the other one is on these uh, six of reverberators. So we have already a little bit of geometrical logic and, and directional logic. So for binaural or spatial synthesis. Um, but I think what we need more is um, incorporating kind of more complex geometries. Um, so more rooms, also combination of outside rooms, inside rooms. Um, I think more care also about everyday rooms. I think the, 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 the research was very much focus on fairly artistic rooms or studio rooms, concert halls, and so on, uh, or fairly extreme rooms like caves and churches. But I think kind of for VR, I think we need kind of a bit more care about everyday rooms and how they are synthesized. And the other one is, I think, which goes more to the heart of the FDNs in terms of computational efficiency. Um, uh, how, how do all these kind of designs behave with many sources and with many listeners? Um, and, and are they um, um, rendered kind of centrally or are they rendered um, in the distributed fashion? And what does this actually mean for, for the reverberator? And the last bit is, uh, I think, on, on differentiable reverberators. I think there was a really nice paper um, this year um, kind of opening um, kind of this field up in a broad way. So kind of thinking about if kind of the reverberator is just one building block kind of in your in your deep learning chain, um, what's the best way to parameterize this? What are the parameters you would like to touch? Um, is FDN kind of the right one? There are also some more brute force approaches, just you trying to learn an FIR and so on. So I think um, this field um, around kind of learnable and kind of in the chain reverberators will be, will be quite exciting, I think, in the next few years. Um, yeah. Um, to kind of conclude the talk, I kind of just two um, quick advertisements. So many of these things you can reproduce kind of with a MATLAB toolbox here. The FDN toolbox includes most of the research results with some kind of examples. So if you're interested in this, that's that's a nice starting point. And, and if you're more interested um, from a uh, from a production side, we also released now um, a commercial plugin uh, together with the Fraunhofer and and, uh, and an audio company in in Munich, uh, which ha has kind of already some engine for for spatial reproduction, and it's it's compatible to MPEG-H and MPEG-I, so these um, new immersive formats. Yeah, um, I think that's that's it. Um, I'll jump over that last example and um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. That was uh, an excellent introduction, overview, and update. Um, <clears throat> do we have any questions? I see uh, lots of hands clapping and icons. <clears throat> um, we have time for some questions. <clears throat> 